Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fall 2017 Horace M. Albright Lecture in Conservation with Dr. M. Sanjan of the Conservation International Organization. I'm Keith Gillis, for those of you that don't know me, Dean of the College of Natural Resources and a professor of forest economics in real life. Um, before we begin, just a couple housekeeping details. Uh, please, no photography uh, or recording during the event. We're going to be recording uh, the evening's lecture uh, with Dr. Dr. Uh, Sanjan, and it'll be available on the website next week. Uh, forward the link on. We, we love the number of people that enjoy these Albright lectures after the fact through posting them on the website. Um, there'll be time at the end for questions, and you'll find the index cards and pencils on your seats. And so write questions on your cards, pass them to the end of the rows. We'll have runners pick those up. And uh, since I'll be asking the questions based on your questions, not what tickles my fancy, but what tickles yours, um, remember that the probability of your question being asked is directly proportional to both legibility and conciseness. So. Um, so, and we'll do as many questions as we can at the end. Um, so everyone take a moment to uh, declare your independence of technology and silence your cell phone um, so that we don't find out the amusing ringtones we all choose in our lighter hearted moments. Um, so thanks to you all for being here. Uh, the Horace Albright Lecture Series at the College of Natural Resources has been going strong for over 50 years. Um, it continues today as a wonderful tribute to Horace Albright's achievements. Uh, we're really honored to have the opportunity uh, through the endowment that pays for this lecture uh, to use this for the public good, uh, fostering dialogue on the critical issues facing our society as it searches for sustainability. And uh, I think everyone in the room will acknowledge that we have never been at a juncture uh, in American society where a civil discourse on critical issues like sustainability was more necessary. Um, the Horace Albright Lecture Series has brought to Berkeley a, a really a who's who over time of the world's most thought-provoking and innovative leaders. And I think the lecture you're gonna hear tonight aligns perfectly with the spirit and traditions of the series. So let me say something about our distinguished speaker tonight. Um, the achievements and lifetime work of our guest lecturer are really remarkable. Uh, Dr. Sanjan was named CEO of Conservation International in May of this year. He's a conservation scientist, he's a writer, an Emmy-nominated news contributor specializing in the role of conservation in saving nature for the benefit of people across the globe. To embark on his new role as chief executive, he recently undertook a 100-day journey through South America, through Africa, and Samoa uh, to assess conservation efforts in some of our most important landscapes. He joined Conservation International in 2014. He's overseen the institution's use of virtual reality filmmaking, including productions such as the ones that we all benefited from seeing uh, just now in the reception, if you were there. Uh, uh, and he's also run uh, their public education campaign, Nature is Speaking. And I have to say, I'm, I'm startled by the value of the virtual reality uh, work that Conservation International is doing to convey the importance of the environment and the beauty of it. And, uh, uh, as a forester, something that would help me teach people about uh, how spatial relationships between different species uh, matter in the ecology of a, of a, of a forest is, is an obvious application. And I could think, wow, how we could use this in silviculture as I was watching some of these virtual reality video videos. And as someone who grew up in part a few blocks from the beach on the windward side of Oahu at Kailua, uh, watching their reef video was really quite moving and uh, the perfect introduction for me to their virtual reality work. So um, it seems when you watch them as if the nature is speaking directly to you. It's very powerful. He's also hosted and co-hosted a range of documentaries and live television events, including PBS and BBC's Big Blue Live, 
which was the first primetime natural history show on American television. And the 2015 PBS and National Geographic television series, Earth, A New Wild, which was filmed in over 24 countries. He was a contributor on Showtime's Emmy award-winning series on climate change, Years of Living Dangerously. One of his recent projects was the University of California produced Climate Lab series published on Vox Media. The six-part video series uh, explores how we can change the way we think and act about climate change, timely to say the least. Uh, it earned over 12 million views and it will turn to Vox Media in mid-November with three new episodes later this month. He's a Disneyland ambassador, a Cato fellow at the Aspen Institute, and a member of the National Geographic Society's Explorers Councils. Council. I'm quite proud to share with you that he is also a product of the UC system, not Berkeley, but uh, his doctorate is from uh, UC Santa Cruz, um, one of our, our really valued peer institutions um, where actually it's, it's, it's fun how many faculty connections there are between those two institutions. They're quite profound. Um, his work's been published in journals like Science, Nature, and Conservation Biology. It's my distinct honor to welcome our fall 2017 Albright speaker, uh, Dr. M. Sanjan, to the podium. Please welcome me and uh, join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Dean Gillis. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to start by making the mood really dark by playing you a short film, and then we'll do the little talk. I am the ocean. I'm water. I'm most of this planet. I shaped it. Every stream, every cloud, and every raindrop, it all comes back to me. One way or another, every living thing here needs me. I'm the source. I'm what they crawled out of. Humans, they're no different. I don't owe them a thing. I give, they take, but I can always take back. That's just the way it's always been. It's not their planet anyway. Never was, never will be. But humans, they take more than their share. They poison me, then they expect me to feed them. Well, it doesn't work that way. If humans want to exist in nature with me and off of me, I suggest they listen close. I'm only going to say this once. If nature isn't kept healthy, humans won't survive. Simple as that. Me, I could give a damn with or without humans. I'm the ocean. I covered this entire planet once, and I can always cover it again. That's all I have to say. So I was born on an island, and I was born a stone throw away from the Indian Ocean. And when I was a baby, my parents, my grandmother actually, who's the matriarch of the family, took me to an astrologer, which is something that they do when babies are born. But the astrologer, instead of reading the palm of your hand, reads the hair on your head, like the cowlicks on a baby's head, and makes a prediction. And this astrologer gave this news to my grandmother, who came back to our house and told my whole family, the whole extended family, that I would die by drowning. So um, for many years, I was not allowed to go into the ocean. You know, the artful placement of my hands there. Um, <laughs> and I could actually see the ocean from that little balcony, but they wouldn't let me get in the water, and to the point where they wouldn't even let me take a bath. Water would have to get poured on my head 
in a, in a bucket. And it made a lot of sense, right? So if your kid was going to die by drowning, ke keeping the child out of water was a very logical way to do this. But um, when I was about nine years old, we moved to Africa, and my um, mother broke with tradition, thank you, and taught me how to swim. And I don't really ever know why she did this, because it's not like she's a great swimmer herself, um, but it completely changed the course of my life. And yet it wasn't the logical thing to do. It was in some ways, if you really think about it, quite counter, not counterintuitive, but counterlogical. But if I went around this audience and I told all of you, okay, you might die by drowning, or better still, your child might die by drowning, do you want to teach them how to swim? I bet you the answer, 95, 99, maybe all of you would say yes. Give the kid a fighting chance. Now I tell you this story because you know, in some ways it's exactly what, where we are and what we're struggling with in, the, in terms of the environmental movement. So the death of the planet has really been foretold. What we do about it now really becomes the real question. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sense of why we have drifted, in my opinion, so far away from what I think is a very fundamental um, piece of life, a piece of human existence, which is our relationship to nature, and why we find ourselves in this predicament where the environmental movement, or the conservation movement, if you'd like, really is a niche, and is really struggling to be heard, and to actually have relevance at scale when it comes to influencing the course of our planet. So, anyone know where that is? Dr. Jarvis, come on. This is a quiz just for you. It's a national park. And if you're gonna guess it, you might guess Glacier, which is exactly where this is. So this is Glacier National Park. And when many of you think about nature, I bet you, you think about something like this. It's, it's true, it is nature. And it's a very Western concept of what nature really is supposed to look like. And even though, you know, I wouldn't call myself Western, I, you, and I grew up in Asia and Africa, even I have been influenced tremendously by sort of what, you know, has been pushed out in terms of my concept of what nature is. When I close my eyes and think about nature, I too think about something like this. Um, I have a place in Montana, and I personally like going for a walk in the woods, knowing that there is something much bigger than me out in the woods that could come out at any time and bite my head off. But the value proposition that go into nature or save nature, it might actually kill you, is really not a great value proposition for most of the planet. And so for most of this planet, believe it or not, when they think about nature, they think about something sort of like this. Or I can show you, you know, numerous photos along these lines. Some sort of use, some sort of interaction, some sort of value in a very different way. Um, if you go onto a beach like this, uh, you know, in, 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 um, uh, in Asia, for example, you know, you really do feel the pulse of nature and you do feel people using nature and interacting with it in a very kind of different, if different way. You can get glimpses of that even here in your backyard. If you go into a park, right? Um, if you go into a, a sort of a slightly urbanized park, um, I don't know the area exactly around here, but say in San Jose, like Alum Rock State Park. It's a pretty nice big park, and if you go in there, and if you go into sort of the areas uh, where there's little creeks flowing and where there's grassy lawns, you will find you know, Asian communities, Hispanic communities, African American communities, it'll be loud, it'll be busy, there'll be food, there'll be grandmas, grandpas, the entire generation of family will be there. There'll be lots of laughter. There'll be lots and lots of sort of party, you know, sort of interaction and partying. And then if you get off on the trail and you sort of go into the higher ground and you get into the sort of higher back country, you'll start seeing people who are dressed in, you know, sort of Patagonia-like kit, usually white, usually alone or in very, very small groups, and usually very quiet. And there's this, this really interesting dichotomy about that. And, I, you know, and I'm attracted to actually both for different reasons, right? But you see that same kind of different people see nature in very different ways, right? Just because of the way you're brought up and what you're, what you're brought up to expect. 
So the film that you just saw um, was the first film in a series of films that Conservation International did to really start a conversation that would try to reframe nature, not as something far away and pristine, but something living and breathing that really can have a huge impact on your life. And it really started because one of our board members, Harrison Ford, um, who's been involved with Conservation International for I think like 26, 27 years, had this long conversation with a really amazing man by the name of Lee Clow. Lee Clow was the marketing genius who did basically every Apple ad from the very first Mac all the way through to the iPad. If you ever thought about the Think Different campaign, um, that was Lee Clow. If you remember the 1984, that famous commercial called 1984, which only played once at the Super Bowl, that you know, everyone talked about the next day because, and no one talked about the game and kind of brought out this whole thing about Super Bowl ads, that was Lee Clow. Um, pretty much a genius. And Lee and Harrison had this conversation about what would nature say to us if unfiltered nature could really speak to people. And that was the first film, it's kind of a dark film, and it kind of mirrors sort of Harrison's mood. And we've done, you know, I th oh, dozen plus films now in 11 different languages, um, and um, you know, 70, 80 million views around the world, um, and, and growing all the time. And they all have their own flavor, depending on what the star is saying, whether, you know, Reese Witherspoon is a different, different feel to it than, um, than Julie Roberts and then, then Harrison Ford. But they all sort of say the same thing, which is like nature doesn't really need people, but people really need nature. And it's a bit of a contrarian message um, that we were trying to shock the audience into realizing that the value proposition has actually changed. We're the ones who are under threat and not nature. And when we first did these films, really about two years ago, we felt that there was a big need for it. But this year, for example, if you really look at what's going on around the planet, if you look at the hurricanes that have hit the East Coast, if you look at the typhoons that have hit Asia, if you look at the fires that have ravaged big parts of this country and around the world, this is a picture of Santa Rosa. As you, many of you know, not very far from here, we know we're talking about 245,000 acres that was incinerated. Um, in my home in Montana, um, until just a week or two ago, I had some neighbors staying there, and they'd stayed in my house for the last couple of weeks because 80,000 acre wildfire came through and pretty much took their um, place out as well. And so they were sort of camped out in my, in my guest bedroom in, in Montana. So it's really affecting all of us. And if you look at what's going on to the planet today, you don't really, it's, nature's really not speaking. Nature's screaming at us. It's screaming at us, and that, that message is very loud and very clear. And what we do about it now is really the big question, right? So I want to give you the sense that, you know, even though conservation and the environmental movement has really tried to sort of portray this picture about us going out to save nature, that really is in some ways a misnomer. It really is sort of the other way around. Um, you know, big things have happened to the planet, including big climate shifts. And sort of like as Harrison sort of Ford's words in that film say, you know, you know, I've covered the earth once and I can do it again sort of image is, is sort of true, right? Um, if you think about how cataclysmic it must have been for life on earth when the first cyanobacteria started producing oxygen and converting our, our atmosphere into an atmosphere that had oxygen in it at quantities that can support a whole different suite of life, but in the process dooming to extinction, this huge other fauna that must have existed at the time. Or if you think about asteroids hitting the planet, or if you think about prolonged exposures to volcanoes going off and the kind of change that it must have created. It really puts what's going on right now into perspective, but also it makes it seem maybe not as bad. But here's the thing that's really kind of interesting about when you look at the planet in sort of geological times. The place that humans are occupying now, living on a planet where the, the concentration of carbon dioxide is, is at 403 parts per million. Um, that's what it is, Mo most recent record is about 403. It's been going up every year, we've been measuring it for the last 50 years. If you look at the Keeling curve, you'll see that. You know, humans have never lived on a planet with more than about 300 parts per million in carbon dioxide. 
ever. So the genus Homo has never been on the planet with that kind of atmosphere. So we're really in uncharted territories in a lot of ways. And so when you really think about who is at danger and who is at, at you know, and, and who you really should worry about, it's humans that we ought to really be worrying about. Um, and so that's sort of the proposition that I'm putting forward to you now. In grand terms, the planet will be okay. Life will persist. Life will evolve. Our shot at it, however, might not work out so well for us, right? So I want to give you um, three quick examples, and then, we'll, um, then we can get into some discussion about it. And these examples are different ways in which I want to show you how conservation and the notion of valuing nature can really play really well in order to provide some great results on the other end. So um, take fisheries. So a billion people depend on fish for protein today, and 90, a full 90% of all fisheries are either fully exploited or overexploited. And if you look at how we've been catching fish, you can see that this says 19. 90 here, this is 1900s here, and this is 2010. From about 1900 to about 2010, for about the last 100 years, we've actually not caught, we've basically plateaued out on how much fish we're catching. And yet the population has continued to increase, and the amount of people who are fully dependent on fish has also continued to increase. So take a project that we're working on in Indonesia. So that's the, that's a, uh, um, that's Papua New Guinea and West Papua, Indonesia. I'm going to talk about the bird's head, which is that little bit that looks like a bird's head that sticks up there. That's an area called um, the bird's head seascape, or Raja Ampat. Some people know that if you're into diving. And it's off the charts when it comes to biodiversity. So it's about the size of Great Britain. About three quarters of the world's known species of coral live there. It's got more fish species than the Great Barrier Reef. 1,800 plus species of fish. And there's at least 350,000 people who depend on the fisheries of Rajampat for their food and for their livelihoods and their sustenance. So over a long period of time, over probably 15 years, um, Lori Katz here really ran that program for, for some years. But over a long period of time, the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, and Conservation International all worked together along with lots of local groups to protect this place. And it essentially became the first big marine protected area or suite of protected areas in Indonesia. And what's neat about Rajampat is obviously people go there for diving. And if you go there for diving today, you get to pay $100 to go dive there. That $100 fee stays in Rajampat. It doesn't go to the national government. It goes into a trust fund that many other organizations have contributed to. Um, the, 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 the spin-off from that trust fund then goes into providing for conservation and monitoring and stewardship and job creation for this region. Now, because of the efforts of this uh, conservation activity, if you go there today, first of all, you'll see sharks, you'll see manta rays. I went there first time probably 12 years ago, eight, nine dives, never saw a shark. This time I went a uh, year and a half ago, and you're seeing them on most dives. You, the fish have come back, the coral reef have come back, and most importantly, people are catching more fish today for less effort. It takes, it's, a, it's about sort of two and a half times more fish for the same amount of effort that they can take out of the water today than they could, um, say, a decade or so ago. So it's good for the people, it's creating jobs and employment, and it's protecting probably the most biodiverse place on the planet. If you watch some of that VR film, it really is about this, this part of the world. So let me tell you about, so let's switch to climate. Um, uh, so the UN, this is very conservative estimates, right? So the UN says by 2030, at least 120 million people more will be in extreme poverty because of climate change. By the end of the century, you're going to have about 200 million climate refugees. Again, very, very conservative estimates, right? That's 20 times more than you saw with the Syrian crisis. So we know that this is going to have mass upheaval in terms of the planet. What you don't hear very much of is the solutions to it. So we know that if you want to stop climate change, you obviously have to deal with emissions. And there's been incredible technology when it comes to emissions. If you look at how quickly I'm going to take this off. So, getting quite hot up here. 
the lights. So you can see how quickly emissions, um, how quickly that we have dealt with technology. And the price of solar, the price of wind, um, have come down dramatically. And we can see that all over the place. We haven't built a coal-fired power plant in the United States since about 2008, for example, right? But what hasn't really changed is the other part of the equation. So it turns out that a lot of emissions actually comes from the destruction of tropical forests. It turns out that um, if you look at the top countries that emit carbon dioxide, you'll find on that list China, you'll find United States, of course you're expecting that. But you will also find Bolivia, and you'll find Indonesia, you'll find Brazil in the top 10. Bolivia is in the top 10. Now you think Bolivia, well that's not about heavy industry. It really is coming from the destruction of tropical forests. That's why you're getting uh, that carbon coming out in the atmosphere. It turns out that if we are going to try to meet the targets that we set in Paris, 1.5 degrees Celsius, trying to hold the planet to something along those lines, at least 30% of the solution to getting to that has to come from the protection of tropical forests. Let's put it another way. If we just ended tropical forest deforestation today, just ended it today, it would be the same equivalency as making every car in the planet into a Tesla. There's a band going on there. It's just keeping in time with me. So it clearly has a big impact. And yet only 2% of the funding goes into tropical forest conservation. Of all the tropical forests that are out there, the place where you find the most amount of carbon density is mangroves, which you're going to go study, hopefully, with your postdoc, right? So it turns out mangroves are just chock full of carbon, because not only is there carbon in the above ground part of mangroves, but mangroves which grow, grow basically they're coastal forests that they grow on that intersection between uh, water and, and land. And they have this amazing ability to grow really fast and then store a lot of carbon into the soil beneath them. Mangroves, it turns out, um, can put carbon down into the soil beneath the water, in some places as far down as six meters underground, right? And it turns out that mangroves, which represent, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Brazil, but mangroves are about less than 1% of tropical forests are mangroves. They're found in a very narrow belt, a, a tropical, subtropical belt uh, around the world and just along those coastlines. So as a, as a global ecosystem, it's under 1%. Yet they contribute to about 20% of that emission load that you're getting from tropical deforestation. Put another way, if we just ended the destruction of mangroves, a very small, a very narrow band of habitat, it would be taking 6% of the emissions out of the atmosphere. Think about that, 6%. So it's actually something you could do. We could actually imagine doing that. You could actually imagine, say in 10 years, basically banning and incentivizing um, the prevention of dis the destruction of mangroves globally. And you would actually turn the dial on your thermostat of the planet in a measurable way. 6% of the emissions come from just this one kind of habitat and the destruction of it, right? So here's a project that we're working on in Brazil. So the Amazon pulls out all that sediment, uh, some of the best mangroves in the world. Probably the most intact stands of mangroves are found near the mouth of the Amazon River. And over there, um, one of the things that local communities rely on are, are these mangrove crabs. They're big crabs, they, they get a high price in the marketplace. Um, they're delicacy and they're well sought after. And we've gone in there, so this is one community I visited not too long ago. In this community, it's a small community, about uh, 3,000 people, and they, most of them are fishers of crab or fish. The mangrove crab that they have here, they basically go out and harvest. A very easy way to catch it. They put a little trap, a noose trap around the, around the hole and the crab comes out, gets caught in it. They only take uh, males. They only take a certain size class. But they do something really interesting to it. They also tag it. We got a grant from Google um, that, does, uh, that gave us some money to do this. This tag is, uh, gives it a unique barcode for every crab. And then that crab is tracked from the village all the way to the restaurant. 
Um, and a restaurant can take out a cell phone and basically scan that barcode and they can find out exactly where that crab is coming from and when it, when it left and when it gets there. And just that little innovation of allowing restauranters to track those crabs from swamp to table has allowed us to double the price of the, that crab, really given a big incentive to the community to protect the crab. So this community has gone out and done that. So if you go there, you'll visit this place, you'll see a community that is making more money out of their fisheries, but they've also gone ahead and protected about 2,000 hectares, about 4,400 acres of mangroves right around their village. I went into that mangrove forest, it's in great shape. Now here's the amazing thing. Guess how much carbon is stored in just that 4,400 acres of mangrove forest? The most recent estimates say it's about the equivalent of the emissions of 1.5 million cars. Just that little forest. So you can see how this job creation scheme that doubles their income also allows for them to protect that piece of nature, also has a huge global value, which they're not really recognizing right now. I mean, any city in the US could easily sponsor that one little village and you're going to get a massive reduction in carbon just by trading credits if, you, if you'd like. Let me take you to South Africa. So South Africa is a really interesting country. Um, it is, um, it's, it's pretty unusual. It's got about 10% of the plant diversity on the planet. It's got about 8% of the bird diversity of the planet. It's got all the big five, the rhinos, the lions, the leopards, the elephants, the buffaloes, and so on and so forth. Mega diverse country. It's also one of the most unequal countries in terms of incomes. In fact, it is the most unequal country in terms of income. It's the highest on the Gini coefficient, which kind of measures uh, uh, global uh, local uh, inequality uh, in income. Now, if you go to South Africa, and I'm going to take you up there near the Mozambique border, there's a very famous national park called Kruger National Park. Have any of you been to Kruger by any chance? Few people have. So it really is a premier destination for wildlife in Africa. If you go to Southern Africa, you're pretty much visiting Kruger or Sabi Sands, which is a private reserve or a, a private group of reserves on the edge of Kruger, right? So it's one giant ecosystem. It's a huge park. If you go to Kruger or if you go to Sabi Sands, some of the lodges there will charge you $2,500 a night per person to stay there. So some of the, the most expensive and luxurious lodges in all of Africa are based here. Um, Paul Tudor Jones, the Singita Lodge is there. Um, Richard Branson's Lodge, Londolozi, other lodges like that are there. And they're really quite like the premier destination where you, know, you get everything your heart desires and you get to see all the animals that you ever wanted to see. Now, what's interesting about Kruger, and that's sort of a picture of what the landscape might look like in some parts of Kruger, but what's interesting about Kruger is right on the edge of Kruger National Park, there's a fence, and you go out of the fence, and you're in the poorest, the poorest rural community in Southern Africa, right there, on the border, right? And the people who are living on that edge of that fence are mostly um, herding cattle. And we've been trying, like many other conservation groups, to figure out ways in which they can herd their cattle and graze their cattle in ways that are more wildlife friendly and that promote uh, biodiversity, promote better grassland, better rangeland, better soil carbon, and all of that good stuff that all of you probably know about living here. And we've had a really hard time doing it. Every time we go into the community, we talk about how they can graze better, how they can reduce conflict with leopards or with wildlife, how they can, how they can rotate the grazing patterns, how they can reduce the number of herds in order to increase the quality of their beef. Mm, they listen to you for a little while and then they're like, well, thanks very much, and they're off again. And they kind of do the same. And so many environmental groups have basically kind of given up on the whole thing and basically think, well, look, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, black African communities just love cows and you're never going to wean them off these, this numbers game. And so inside the park and inside these private reserves, you have amazing grasslands. On the outside, you have shit. It's terrible. It's broken land. It turns out that there's a reason for this. And it, the reason is, is insidious and it's deep. So if you go and talk to someone like this, this is a guy, uh, his, his real name is Lion, 
His name is Lion Tete, that's his real name. And he was one of the people who was actually moved out of Kruger um, maybe 30, 30 or 40 years ago when Kruger's borders were adjusted. And he lives outside of the park, and he's a, he's a village chief, a headman. Um, and if you talk to him about, say, rhinos, because rhino poaching in Kruger is quite high, a, a rhino is killed every night in Kruger, every single day, often more than one. Um, it's got the biggest population of rhinos in the world, but it also has the highest poaching rates of rhinos in the world. And you talk to him about rhinos, he'll say something like this. He'll say, I'll start caring about your rhinos when you start caring about my cows. So you start talking to him about his cows, and what you realize very quickly is that he has a real problem. So these are his cows. There's the fence to Kruger. It's electrified. And on the other side is wildlife, right? You can see buffalo there, but sometimes you'll see elephants, sometimes you'll see lions, and so on and so forth. Because his cows live in close proximity to wildlife, which is frankly the way in which most indigenous communities in Africa graze their animals, these cows are not allowed to enter the market. You can't transport them basically to a town or a city and slaughter them and get them into the food supply chain because countries worry about foot and mouth disease and other diseases like foot and mouth disease, but foot and mouth disease is a big one. Now, foot and mouth disease, which is endemic throughout much of Africa, and it's found in wildlife populations like in these buffalo, is not dangerous to cows. It doesn't kill them. It doesn't kill people either. But it does harm milk-producing cows. So the European Union, for example, and places where they have dairy cows are paranoid about getting foot and mouth disease anywhere near them. And because of this, a system has been set up in much of Africa where the land is fenced, and there are areas which are clean zones on the other side of the quarantine zone where people are allowed to have pastures and pasture cows, and they're the ones who have access to markets, and they're the ones who have nice fat cows, and they're the ones who think about rangeland management, and they're the ones who understand that if they, if they treat their cows in a certain way, if they, if they graze them in a certain way, the grass will actually be better, and you'll have more diversity in the, in the land, and you'll get a better price. On the other side of the fence, you have people who have absolutely no incentive at all, except to have more and more and more cows, because they have no access to markets. Now, it's not surprising that the people who live in the nice fenced quarantine zone also tend to be either white, because they came from the apartheid system, or from some sort of colonial system, if you're looking at Kenya, or politically connected, or have very large commercial ranches. And then the people on the other side of that fence is just communities. As many cows as you want, no access to market. Now, the only way to deal with this thus far has been to take the cows and put them in quarantine. You can quarantine them for a few months and then you can put them back into the marketplace, right? But com communities hate doing that. They hate to be away from their cows. And m walking them to the market just doesn't make sense. They lose so much weight that by the time they get there, you can never make it back in terms of um, money. So after many years of struggling with this problem, what we did was we built a mobile abattoir, a mobile butcher shop. And here it is. So this is the first mobile abattoir, I think, in kind of in Southern Africa. And this one, or in, maybe in the, certainly in Africa. So this one, custom built to the highest standards, it attaches to a refrigeration truck. Just this summer was taken into that community where Mr. Tete lives. The community brought their cows in. They selected 17 of them. They were slaughtered in this butcher shop, processed. The meat goes into a refrigeration truck. The truck then drives it into the park to these really fancy $2,000 a night lodges. And the meat was sold there for the first time ever. So for the first time ever in the history of Kruger Park, in the 100 plus year of this park, cows, beef from the community, which lives right on the border of the park, was actually sold inside the park. We actually have now an agreement with 40 of the lodges to supply beef to the, to the park that way. And so this has completely been a game changer for us in our ability now to be able to interact with this community and talk about rangeland management and about better practices and about conservation and ultimately about rhinos as well. So now this program is expanding really dramatically. Um, for just, a, um, just one single cow sold into the park is about nine months of salary for an individual. So it's quite a lot of money that they get by selling that beef. 
Um, it's, it's created just in that Kruger area about 300 new jobs. Um, and it really helps protect about 340,000 acres of, of land. Which, and those jobs, by the way, are all eco-rangers, people who are now working with the community to change grazing practices, partly paid for by the sale of that beef. So it's really a sort of a subversive system in some ways. About 40% of Africa is actually grazing land. And if you can do this at scale, community grazing land, you really can upend the system of why communities don't ever have access to markets and find a new solution for that. So before we get to questions, I want to get into a couple of other things that I just wanted to sort of mention to you. So what I'm trying to do is tell you that, look, all of you are here in this room because you probably love nature. It's kind of the reason why I do what I do as well, right? I got into this because from, my, from a very small age, from, from the time I was a child, I really loved nature. But I realized at some point in my life that love alone was not enough, that you really had to think about this in a very different way, and that for most of the planet, for most of the planet, the people who are not in this room, it really comes down to value. And unless you can create a value proposition that ties the things you love to what they care about, you will always only be talking to a very, very small segment of the population, and it will always depend on external inputs to keep it going. In all three of these projects I talked to you about, that none of them require a lot of external inputs in order to keep them going. Sure, philanthropy, which is important, plays a role, but over the long run, the money is actually being produced within the life cycle of the project itself. And so it doesn't require that additional and constant input of, of sort of outside funding. So if you want to scale conservation at the end of the day, you really have to make it about value. Two other things that I want to add to that. The first is about the messenger. So this guy here on the left is a really interesting guy by the name of Ramanathan. He's a professor at Scripps. And I met him um, a year or two ago, and he told me this amazing story. So he's an atmospheric scientist, and he studies the atmosphere on distant planets. And he's used the same kind of technology to then turn the focus on, the plan on planet Earth. And he studies the atmosphere of planet Earth. And he's basically won every prize you can think of, published in every paper you can think of, and has really reached the pinnacle of his career as a climate and atmospheric scientist. He's a Hindu by birth. That's important right now because of who he's standing next to. But he was also um, named to be part of the Vatican's Council of Scientific Advisors some years ago. And he got this interesting message one day saying that while he was at the Vatican, while he was with the council and he was they're working on a, on a paper, um, he got a message saying Pope Francis would like to meet you. And so he got really excited about this, and he had a whole speech prepared for him, and he memorized the speech in Spanish so that he could talk to Pope Francis in his native language. But when the time came for him to actually meet with the Pope, it wasn't in sort of an audience chamber as he had expected, but it was actually in the parking lot. And he was sort of rushed out, and he had to run through this parking lot, and a little Fiat pulls up, and out pops the Pope. And so all of a sudden, he's right there with the man, and he completely forgets all his Spanish. And so he just goes back to the basics. He had this whole sort of scientific speech prepared for the Pope about climate change and atmospheric science, how it was changing, what the impacts might be, and so on and so forth. But he forgot all of it. He went to English. And he said to the Pope, um, Holy Father, climate change is not a scientific issue. It's a moral issue. And you, as the moral authority, or one of the moral authorities on the planet, have an obligation, have a duty to your flock to speak out on this issue. And that conversation actually lasted about 20 minutes. It, was, it became a sort of a long dialogue between him and the Pope in that parking lot. The next day, the Pope puts out a tweet. The first time he had tweeted about climate change. And um, you can actually see the bump that you see when the 300 million Catholics who follow the Pope, you know, basically got this Twitter blast that goes, that went to their churches, went to their communities, went to uh, their neighbors, their family, and their friends. And you actually saw this little bump 
amongst Catholics in their acceptance or understanding or willingness to look into this new issue of climate change. It's actually called the Francis Effect. It actually has a name, right? Now, I tell you this story because it's the most unusual story you can imagine. Here's a Hindu scientist from Scripps who managed to convince the, you know, the head of the Catholic Church to put out a message that would be influential to his, to his flock. And it made a big difference. Much more so, as Ramanavan tells me, than his entire career of working as an atmospheric scientist. For him, that was the most important moment of his life. Like everything else led up to that one moment when he had that one sort of brain spark. And he didn't go into science, he just went straight to moral authority. Why I'm telling you this is because the messenger really does matter even more so than the message. And I think one of the challenges that scientists have, and conservationists certainly have, is that we try to talk to people about science. And we try to talk to them about data. And it doesn't really work, except for scientists. For everyone else on the planet, they want you to hear the, they, the message has to come in a different way. And it has to come from a different person. So it turns out that people basically listen to their neighbors. They listen to the people that they go to the same church with. They listen to people in their fraternity. They live, listen to people who are um, their colleagues and coworkers at work. They listen to their family. So the messenger to me is as important as the message. And there's lots of examples of this that I can give you uh, if we had more time to sort of make that message clear to you that all of you have communities that you can reach that I could never reach and potentially vice versa. And so all of you have an obligation and a duty to be a messenger. Even if you're not 100% sure about the message, you don't need to be a scientist to be able to talk about conservation, about the environment. You're much more likely to influence people um, if you can speak to them as a comrade, as a co-patriot, as, as someone who they trust because you're part of whatever group you're part of. The Pope could talk to the Catholic uh, community in a way that no scientist could ever could. And that's what made, made the difference there. The, the second point I want to make is kind of a diff slightly different point, but, um, and it, it really has to do with meeting people where they are rather than where you are. So I came to this country um, for, for college and for graduate school. And when I came to UC Santa Cruz for my PhD, um, I wanted to study, um, I wanted to study cheetahs um, with a guy named Michael Soule, who is sort of a um, guy who coined the word conservation biology, often talked of as one of the founders of the field. And um, because I'd grown up in Africa, I thought this is exactly what I would do. I would be sitting out there under a tree in Tanzania or Kenya looking for cheetahs uh, on the African plain. My plans completely went sideways. About two years after I had gone into my PhD program and I had defended my, uh, I'd gone through my sort of first round of exams and my proposal was accepted as a, as a correct, good proposal to study, I was in Washington, D.C. getting a visa, a research visa for Namibia, which is where I was going to do my work, um, I got a phone call from my advisor saying my project had been canceled. And I had to come back to Santa Cruz. And the, cancel, the project got canceled, had nothing to do with me. It actually had to do with uh, a challenge that they had with USAID giving money to the San Diego Zoo and everything going sideways. So here I was, two years into my program, kind of abandoned. Um, and I had to find something quickly to do. And what I ended up studying were these things. Well, actually, it wasn't this thing. So I asked for a picture of a gopher, and this is what they gave me, which is not really what I actually studied. This is actually a marmot, which people call gophers, but they're not, go they're not actually the gopher that I studied, right? So I studied an animal, G genus is Tomomis. And if you actually at Berkeley, you'd know a lot about them because the uh, vertebrate museum here has an amazing collection of gophers. But gophers are those little things that make those mounds on your garden, right? The bane of every gardener and a big agricultural pest in California. And I switched to gophers and I ended up studying this. And I can tell you at some other point why I did that. And it was brilliant. It actually ended up being so much more useful for me than anything I could have ever done with cheetahs. But one of the things I learned during that study was I spent a lot of time in California in, in agricultural communities, up and down the Central Valley. 
Um, and so I would go to these, uh, these farmers, drive up there, and knock on their door and ask them whether I could catch some gophers, which was an amazing thing for them to hear. Um, <laughs> And so I was always welcome. I was invited in. I could stay for the barbecue. People invited me for Thanksgiving. I mean, I really, really very, very welcomed into every farming community you can imagine. All Republican, by the way. All like, you want to catch gophers? My study became known as the damn gopher study. It actually made, on the, it made it to the cover, believe it or not, it made it to the cover of the Sacramento Bee. Above the fold, photograph. They actually found a photograph of a gopher. Like, my parents actually framed it. It's in their house. It's a framed photo, a picture of the Sacramento Bee front cover of it. That, that's how sort of it became. But what they didn't realize is that at night I would go back and release the same gophers. Right there. It's a, it's a, it was a catch and release study, and I sort of only talked to them about the catching part, right? Um, uh, so, so um, but here's what I got from them. And really confirmed, it really transformed the way I saw, um, I saw people in the state and who I was really speaking to. I mean, think about it. I was in Santa Cruz. This is my first experience. And then I get to meet this different community. And I realized that those farmers knew a lot about the land. They actually cared about the land. They cared about the wildlife on the land. They could tell you things about the pattern, about drought, about things like the first day of frost that, you know, I couldn't get anywhere else. But I realized that I would have to meet them where they are, not where I was, that they weren't going to come to me, that I would have to go to them. And I think that's the second point I just wanted to leave you with, that if you want your message to be heard, you really have to go to, you have to meet people where they are. You have to deal with what their issues are first before they're going to be willing to listen to what you know, my issues are. Um, we mentioned this very quickly. I mean, this, this series that I'm doing with the UC school system with Vox is called Climate Labs. Um, it's actually nine episodes now. We just filmed three more, and I think there's plans to do, do more of them. They're just these short six to eight minute videos on a particular topic that tries to meet people where they are. Like food waste, we go into the cafeteria and we talk about food waste. So really just trying to sort of get away from the preaching from afar and going to communities or going to students or going to folks and dealing with what they are dealing with on a kind of day-to-day day -day, um, existence. And, um, you know, I, you know I, I, I'll, I'll leave this for, for another day. I, I was going to tell you, you know, I just came back from Samoa, and this is one of the voyaging canoes that the Samoans use. Um, this is a Polynesian voyaging ca canoe. It's sort, of, it's, a, it's sort of an exact replica of the canoes that the Polynesians would use for these incredible voyages. The Polynesians were the greatest voyagers on the planet, uh, you know, the, the greatest explorers that the world has ever known, ever known, were the Polynesians. There's nothing close to it. There's no other expedition that humans have done that even come anywhere near what these guys were doing. They were doing this, these incredibly long voyages, you know, 4,000 miles into the Pacific Ocean, 6,000 miles into the Pacific Ocean, trying to hit infinitesimally small specks of land when they did not possess the technology for a wheel, when they did not possess the technology for metal, when they had no compass, they were doing these journeys. Even if we go to Mars, it would be nothing compared to these journeys that these guys did. Because the Mars journeys would be like, it's 143 days, there it is, you'll go there, you'll spend three days, you'll come back. It's dangerous, but you actually know what you're doing, you know all the steps all the way through. When they would leave on these voyages, they had absolutely you know, no certainty of, of, of hitting anything. And then they would have to figure out a way, obviously, to come back. It was two-way two -way voyages as well. And um, I put this out there because what's going on in the Pacific today is kind of amazing. You have this whole new group of Polynesian leaders in islands like Samoa and Fiji and the Cook Islands and Palau and um, Kiribati. And they are really willing to step up and be real leaders for climate change and real leaders for marine conservation at a scale that I've never seen before. So at times when I kind of get discouraged, I just have to look around the world, and you really just do see people who are leading again. And these were the na navigators of the past, and once again, they're willing to navigate into the future. So thank you. I'll stop there. And if there's a couple of questions, we take that. So I think our staff will be uh bringing me up some cards okay. from your questions, Great. but uh, 
you know, as a former resident of Kailua, I want to thank you for the shout out to the Polynesian Voyaging Society. And of course. we should also say that it was part of getting Native Hawaiian kids a feeling of reconnectedness with their history. Yeah, and absolutely. So it's been just a transformative organization yes. in Hawaii. And uh, the most unusual lead uh, keynote address for a Society of American Foresters meeting ever when we met in Honolulu was to have the, the head of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Wow. It was quite moving, and I think everyone understood the tie between people of the land and people of the sea right. at that point. So. Right. Um, it, so that, it, it that, that particular um, boat that you saw uh, is in Samoa, and the, um, the president of the Samoan uh, Voyaging Society works for Conservation International. They take that boat out to remote communities, and they actually play that film Moana, the Disney mm -hmm. film. They play the film Moana on those sails, and all the kids and the entire community comes out, sits around the boat, they watch the film, and then they talk to them about sort of you know, Polynesian culture and about conservation. So that's sort of how they, they do it yeah. in, in these very remote, small atoll yeah. communities. It's quite beautiful. So while I'm waiting for a question, just let me ask you a question, given this is a mostly American audience. Um, I think you were, said something quite profound and you communicate with people by meeting them where they are. Yeah. Um, as someone that's trained a bunch of PhDs that were international conservation or development, um, it's always struck me how we as Americans have to rethink how we connect with the rest of the world. And do you, any advice to us as a country? I mean, at oh the moment, the, the voice we're projecting um, is one of us. And, and so how do we actually meet on, on the right terms? We care about the rest of the world, but I'm not sure Americans are very skilled at meeting the rest of the world where they are. You know, that's, so that's a big question. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, I, I don't want to extend too far on that just because of, of the significance of that question. So, you know, the, the thing that, in our field, the thing that hits most is climate change, right? Mm -hmm. The U.S. is now the only country, amazing, the only country that is not in the Paris Climate Accord. So either we know something that the other 198 countries don't know, or we're just willfully not willing to be there. But the interesting thing about that is when I say we, I really just mean the U.S. government. And when I say the U.S. government, I mean just mean the White House as a representation of the U.S. government. What's interesting about the Paris Climate Accords is that even though um, the White House decided to pull us out of it, first of all, it can't go into effect. Um, if someone had read the fine print, they would realize that it doesn't actually go into effect until a couple of days after the next presidential election. Right, so that's the first good, that's the first interesting piece of news about it. So even if you wanted to pull it out, you couldn't because the date that it was signed was November 6th, I believe. And so it's four years from November 6th. So it just so happened to be like a couple of days after the next elections. Um, the second thing I would say is that even though we, are, we sort of got out of it or have indicated that we're getting, going to get out of it, companies have stepped in. Citizens have stepped in. Cities and states have stepped in. And I think it was just an amazing moment that you saw with these ads in the, in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, where company after company after company, every business as diverse as you know, retailers to you know, so Walmart to Patagonia, Disney to, uh, I don't know, Exxon or Chevron, you know, just Starbucks, all coming out and basically saying, we're still in. And for the first time, you actually saw this amazing moment happen where the environmental community and the business community were actually aligned on the same side of the coin, completely aligned. So I, was, I see that as an extraordinarily powerful moment. I think we'll look back in history and realize that that was that moment where we all decided to take responsibility for our action instead of shifting the blame onto the other side. Mm -hmm. So am I positive about it? I think that the world and the United States will weather 
the current indecisions that you see and the current skepticism of science you see among some quarters of the government. I think if, if, if it's a eight, two-term presidency or longer than that, or you know, who knows? But I think in the, in the short term, I think, I think we'll actually emerge from the stronger. Um, so this is an interesting question that you touched on in one of your slides briefly. And uh, the question is from someone who's pointing out sort of the history of the conservation movement, yeah. that the leadership and, and target for many of the activities was in essence, it's older, it's white, it's male. Right. Uh, and so they're saying, how do we make the conservation movement as a whole more inclusive? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think that you start, you know, I think that there is no, the environmental movement and the conservation movement is the least meritocratous of, of groups that I can possibly think of. Like, if, if, if you were, like any other field, banking, technology, medicine, engineering, law, I mean, I can't think of any profession that is so skewed as the conservation movement is, particularly at the sort of top end of the spectrum. Um, in the history of the big environmental organizations, I think there's only been one, uh, one woman CEO of the, of the big ones uh, for, for, for one, one term. Um, and certainly, I don't, well certainly there's no one of my color or darker running a big environmental group now or, or ever, like ever. Mm -hmm. That's kind of shocking if you actually think about it for just a moment because most of the organizations are, like when, you, when you're called the World Wildlife Fund, the, the world is in the front of that. And you think about the wildlife and you think, well, where's most of all of that? And then who's running it? It just, it just smacks at you quite hard. You know, you definitely feel very lonely when you walk into those rooms and you um, are instantly, instantly the, uh, the minority. So you have to start, you know, you, you have to start with the way you recruit. You have to, um, so for our organization, at least half our staff are millennials. We split pretty nicely, 50-50, male, female, almost exactly to a T. I think we have pretty good representation, we have great representation at the lower end of the jobs, the incoming jobs, and we have pretty good representation at the very highest end. We lag in the middle, that pipeline where, you know, you know, women who are coming in or minorities who are coming in, I don't even want to call them minorities because in our world, they're actually the majorities who are coming in are given that opportunity to scale and climb and learn a whole lingo that, that, that is not otherwise common. So that's the other thing, right? So oftentimes, the people we can recruit from minority communities just are speaking a different lingo than what we are used to as conservationists. Um, I, you, know, you, you know, they might not fly fish or bird watch. Or, I mean, they just are, they're reading different books. And so there's a lot of sort of biases that are just built into interview systems and processes that help people sort of succeed in that. Um, so I think you just have to recruit really hard. I think you have to really ask the question of why you're not seeing more people. I think if the conservation movement starts understanding that you need, you know, the only way you're going to get this message across and scale it is if you have people who look like the people that they're actually trying to convince. And I just don't mean this. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't just be about white and non-white. It, it could be about your, your um, ethnicity, your religious background, um, your, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, I mean, all of that counts depending on who the audience is. I think those questions need to be asked and, you, and I would, I'd love the audience and I'd love people to ask that and make it a priority. I mean, look, look you just turn on Discovery Channel any day of the week. Take, turn on National Geographic any day of the week. Just look at who, the, who our kids, your kids, are looking at as heroes for the planet for the future. Just, it's amazing. It's actually amazing how few. Do you, listen to this. Just the other day, I mean, I think the Guardian or the Daily Telegraph in London put a full page, like front page, like big, beautiful picture, uh, and the headline was something like, the Prince of Belgium, you know, the, uh, the Belgian Prince Saving the Congo, something like that. And it's about this amazing guy who's the, the, the hero of the film, Virunga. 
And no, I mean, like, I'm, you know, no, I'm not casting any shade on him. He, he really is a hero. But my Lord, what a terrible headline. The Belgian saving Congo prince. I mean, like, I mean, are you mad if you're, a, if you're a journalist writing this thing? I mean, you have absolutely no understanding of history. And how do you think the people in the Congo feel about that headline, right? And yet that's what they're trying to say. And so we just have to kind of get away. I mean, look, the worst thing, my parents watched Al Gore's first film because it was Al Gore. No doubt about it. But the minute Al Gore became the symbol of climate change, you were going to lose half the audience just on principle. Like, be honest, if Sarah Palin went out there and made a really great film about marine environments, how many of you would actually give that film a, sh a chance? We wouldn't. We just wouldn't, be honest. So why do we think all of a sudden someone else will do it differently just because Al Gore did it? I mean, the, he should have done the film. He just shouldn't have been in the film. Because by doing that, you just take everything away. I mean, the, 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 even just go, you know, the years of living dangerously, I spent an entire year doing that show. It's celebrity after celebrity after celebrity. Celebrities can be very useful. They definitely get people to sit up and listen. But when we did this nature speaking thing, one thing you never see is the celebrity themselves. That's not Harrison, you never saw Harrison Ford. I never even said to you that's Harrison Ford. He doesn't say brought to you by Harrison Ford. You just hear the ocean. He's actually being an actor. That's what he's doing. The same thing Penelope Cruz did, the same thing. You know, same thing um, Edward Norton did. They just played a role. Edward Norton was the soil, Harrison Ford was the ocean, Reese with the spoon was home. So it was a voice that you understood and, and loved, but you couldn't quite put the finger on why, but it was the ocean speaking to you. It wasn't Harrison Ford speaking to you. Because the minute, because you have to ask yourself, if you have a whole show on climate change and it's just celebrities, what the hell do they know? Like, I mean, like, what life are they living that I'm supposed to all of a sudden, like, empathize with, right? Just doesn't make sense. Don't get me wrong, there are some celebrities who understand this topic really deeply. DiCaprio knows what he's talking about because he's been in it for a long, long time. Harrison Ford knows what he's talking about. Edward Norton knows what he's talking about. There are people who are celebrities who also have done their homework. They're very smart and they're, you know, but that strategy, just because it's a celebrity, I'm going to change my behavior, absolutely doesn't work. Wonderful answer. Sorry. And no, it, 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 like... Well, there should be passion about this. And my own students come to me with some regularity asking this same challenge that's implicit in this question. Right. And how are, we, how are we going to make a change? Because if Berkeley can't make a change to reflect this... Then who can? Then who can? Yeah. So I think it's a wonderful question from them. Um, so a lot of what you've been covering here is, is how to deal with the fact, and I think this is implicit in many of the questions here, that we're realizing we don't communicate well uh, outside of the nerdly scientific community with numbers and graphs and tables, um, that in fact humans are wired for narrative. Yeah. And so part of the environmental movement's failure, but part of all scientists that work in public policy's failure is trying to speak in a language which has no resonance with the audience they're trying to reach. So any advice? There's a, a fair number of people here that control the, the training and mentoring of the next generation of scientists, as uh, some like me are moving rapidly out of the picture. Um, so. Any idea about what, how we could do a better job in academia of training yeah. scientists to be effective advocates? Right, so I think that's the one thing that I wish I saw more when I was in school or graduate school. I, I did not have the opportunity to ever take classes on communications except if I would just go over and take a fiction writing class. So I tell students this, I think, I think writing fiction is really important. Uh, poetry and fiction, they just, they just exercise a different part of your brain that deals with the emotion, deals with the heart. People give, so what motivates people to give? And I use give in a sort of loose word, uh, take action, right? So people give or people take action basically because, of, of, because they fall in love with a person. You know, I love Jane Goodall, so I'm going to support her work. 
or they fall in love with an animal. It's very rarely a plant. It can be a plant if it's like a redwood, but mostly it's animals. Like I love pandas, or I love blue whales, or I love coral reefs, or they fall in love with a place. You know, I love the marine headlands, right? That's it. So there's always love that first and foremost comes through as the reason why you, your audience gets engaged. Then the brain is what decides how much you give or how you actually take action or what you're willing to do. And we tend to sort of go straight to the brain when we're trying to make this convincing argument, um, whereas we should be going much more to the heart. So for me, being able to integrate classes lectures, you know, um, coursework that involves communication, but communicating, you know, to the heart, not, not scientific communication per se, I think is really quite important. I also think that humans are wired to think in the short term, not the long term, right? So we have absolutely, there's no, there's sort of no evolutionary advantage to us thinking in the long term. We just don't do it. There's no way to make that become a heritable trait. So we are really wired to think short term, and short term meaning like, you know, the length of your reproductive life type of thing, right? So by the time, you know, 10, 20 year time frame, we sort of can understand and we'll take action on. But anything beyond that, anything beyond our, when, you know, sort of having a child type of, it just doesn't make a difference. It, it, you, you know, it, it just goes away. So the minute we start talking about, you know, 100, 200, 300 year time frames in the future, it's a very difficult concept for people to, to grasp. Um, so. so this is an interesting question. I, I need to rephrase it slightly, but could you comment on conservation based on two different arguments as to how you feel their relative effectiveness works? One is thinking about convincing people of the intrinsic value right. of a species. And the right. other is, as yeah. was sort of embodied in the video you showed, the idea that people need nature as opposed to uh, the intrinsic value of nature. Yeah, the intrins intrinsic value, like believe me, I don't actually know why that got turned on in me. I just don't. And I absolutely have no idea how to turn it on on other people, in other people. I just don't. Like, I, like even like my, my sister or my parents, I can get them a little bit of the way, but like, my God, those are as close to me as you possibly can be, right? And I just can't get them kind of that whole way there. I mean, they'll do it, but they mostly do it because they're doing it out of love for me or respect for me, not because they have somehow now had that switch. If E.O. Wilson can't do it with his books, how am I supposed to do this? If Jane Goodall can't do it, how am I supposed to do it? These are people who make most of their arguments based on that intrinsic value of nature. And they're far better storytellers, far better motiv motivators than I could ever be. It just won't work, not fast enough. Not fast enough to what we actually need to get done. So as much as I want to tell you, yes, you know, we need to protect nature for its intrinsic value. And believe me, I would. I do. I've got no problem doing that. I just don't know how to get everyone else to do it. And so I have to figure out a way to scale. And the only way I can think about scaling and scaling really fast is to make it about value. And the first uh, mode of action there is, is businesses. Because businesses can deal with that switch fast. Right? They can switch, they can, they can do it very quickly. So innovation happens fast in business. It tends to be rational. If you can make a value argument, they can quite, the adoption rate is very, very quick. And then in the long run, it's governments. Because when a government flips or sort of gets this or gets this message in some part of their DNA, it can, be make, it can make a massive change, bigger than any business can actually do because of just the size of the budgets. But governments are slow. So you kind of need, you know, so my role, my role is to sort of think about NGOs and conservation groups, academic groups, as being able to provide those vehicles and provide those, take those risks to convince businesses to change their behavior because of their own self-interest and then change governments because ultimately it'll get more votes because it means that they're taking care of their people a bit better. And it, and it does happen, it happens fast. And the interesting thing about this is, especially with businesses, it'll happen in ways in which you won't even know about it. 
So the you know it, it so that's what I find quite fascinating, you, you know, to see right now. How many of you have ever gone to McDonald's? I'm just curious. Ah, oh, good number of people here. Amazing. You're willing to say it. If you go to McDonald's, to say it in Berkeley. Willing to say in Berkeley. If you go to McDonald's, the best thing to eat in McDonald's is the McFish sandwich, and here's why. So the McFish sandwich that you can eat in McDonald's is the same certification standards for fish as you get at Whole Foods. Let me say that again. That McFish sandwich you get in McDonald's is the same certification as Whole Foods. Here's another shocker. You ever buy fish at Walmart? It's pretty much the same certification standard as Whole Foods. That's shocking, shocking right? Like, think about that. It's because you know, Walmart does it because they genuinely don't want to run out of fish. I mean, if you're serving seven billion people at some, at some level, you really, really do need to think about sustainability because otherwise you can't actually sell at scale. So they both do it. They're doing it for very different reasons. One's just going to charge you a high price and promote that as a virtue of, you know, love and good living. The other is going to do it just purely as a necessity. Now just look at the size of the scale at which Walmart does fish and the scale at which Whole Foods does fish, and you'll, you'll see the massive difference in the two. So I'm going to combine a whole bunch of questions here, which sure. to me are they're questions about, I would say, project design mm -hmm. or mechanism. So there's questions about uh, shouldn't we be working on cook stoves as a priority, or yeah. shouldn't we, it's kind of an eco-modernist uh, argument that shouldn't urbanization be the key to saving conservation? Uh, wouldn't it be better to have the, the cattle ranching aim towards self-sufficiency as opposed to marketing inside Kruger? Sure. So there's a lot of things at a detailed level. Yeah. You've taken a very different approach here, kind of for an organization like yours. Yeah. What's the sweet spot in terms of detailed program design or high-level messaging? Great, great question. So on that, on that cattle one, I, that example I gave you is just one example. Where we're doing it at much bigger scales in Namako land, um, we are not marketing to a national park. There, there it's going into um, a big supermarket chain called Woolworths, which is like the biggest supermarket, high-end supermarket chain in South Africa, and under a label called Meat Naturally. So we're doing exactly that. We're not just marketing into the park. I just use that as an example because of the stark contrast between the haves and the have-nots and the way to, to sort of subvert that system. So look, at the end of the day, you need to do what you can where you're at with what you have, right? It's a Roosevelt quote or a Gandhi quote or however you want to parse it. It's, 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 I believe in that. What I hate, what I hate is people who sit on the sidelines and wait for a better way. Well, we're not going to give or we're not going to get involved because we want like the better design. Like, it, you know, come, you're going to run out of time. So just get in the game. All of it is good. I'm not criticizing any of it. All of it is good. Whatever you think makes a difference and where you feel you get most amount of enjoyment from it, get involved in it. So if cook stoves are the thing that you want to focus your energy on, absolutely. My grandmother died of emphysema because she literally did not have a window in her kitchen. No window. She'd go in there with a lamp, a kerosene lamp. That's the way they built them in those days. My niece today can't even fathom a life like that because the kitchen and the huge glass windows they have is sort of the center of the house, right? Mm -hmm. So do what you want to, you know, do what you can, but do it now. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't sit this out. For Conservation International, for me, every project we do has to have an exit strategy. We will always be strangers in a strange land. Going in and thinking that we're there forever and it's always going to be philanthropic is just not going to work. Can't scale that. So I want us to look at ways in which we can use conservation as a disruptive model of change, as a way of changing some kind of existing paradigm, but with the full intention that in, say, six to 10 years, whatever system we're putting in place has to stand up on its own feet, maybe not perfectly, but close to it. Maybe it's 60%, maybe 70%, maybe 80% is being built within the project. It's not outside addition. If we can do that and do that at scale, then we can actually start 
kind of having these replicable models. But I think the first thing you do is when you get into wherever you want to work, I think for me, the first thing is just asking what's the current, you know, what's the model that exists in place and what, what will disrupt it? What can we do? Because that's where private philanthropy can be useful. There's no reason we have to do the same thing everyone else does. We can actually try something different. Like the, the, the woman who does that South Africa program, you know, um, a woman named Sarah Frizee has been banging about this for years to me. And I just never understood it. I was used to call it like CI for her stand for Cow International. I'm like, how can you just talk about cows? You, you work in South Africa. This is an amazing place. Like, this is like 10% of the bird species on the planet are in South Africa. And you just want to talk about cows. And then finally, you know, once I saw what she was doing, I realized what she was up to. And it was just it completely sort of mind-blowing how she had sort of subverted the whole system and created all these jobs and now has a way of really having a conversation with the people whose, whose, whose actions will actually determine the outcome for wildlife. Mm -hmm. So this could be a final question, sure. and I'm targeting it for the students who many of them are en route home because this is the Thursday night before a university holiday on Friday. Of course, yes. <laughs> um, so for all of the students in the College of Natural Resources and Environmental Science, Conservation right. Resource Studies, uh, a lot of people that are looking for to making a difference. Yeah. You know, what advice do you have someone that's at the onset of a career where they've chosen to study these things yeah. because they want to make a difference? Sure. So what, what would I have done if I had to do it again yeah. in some ways, right? So I would have taken a, so the most important two or three things that I did when I was in college that turned out to be really fortunate, happened all by chance. Um, I would get jobs in the summers that were completely different from my work, my thesis work. And I had to fight with my advisor it, as an undergrad and as a grad student. I always had this sort of tension with my advisors about what I was going to spend, you know, whatever downtime I had. So, you know, my field seasons were in the spring. And so I would actually have sort of the summers kind of off. And I would go and I was an intern at the World Bank. I did that like three years in a row. Like first year was an intern, the second and third year I was a consultant. They would actually pay my, they would pay me money which I'd put back into research, right? It was incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable. That kind of eye-opening to a world that I knew nothing about and you know, it's the furthest thing away from a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz who was studying genetics, population genetics in a fossorial rodent, <laughs> right? And then I was walking the halls of the, of the World Bank. It was just really, really useful. So what I would sort of say is that get in, start doing things that are really different from whatever thing you're studying. It could be design, it could be engineering, it could be food, I don't really care what it is. But, but just make just a giant jump because all the cool stuff happens on those angles. The coolest innovations you'll do are when you bring two fields together, or three fields together, right? The second thing I would do is, is communication. So like, you know, writing fiction, taking poetry classes, um, you know, exercising that part of your brain. Becoming a communicator is, a, is something you can learn. It's a skill, you can actually learn it. Um, I was painfully shy as a, as, a, as a student. I mean, like absolutely painfully shy as a student. And so you can train yourself to be comfortable on stage or comfortable in, you know, front of audiences. And it's a really important thing. It's probably the only thing that I do well is by, by, by telling a story well, I can convince people to follow me. And it's a really great trick to have in your sleeve. And the third thing I would do is I would say that, you know, at one part of your life, if, especially if you're a graduate student, you have to be able to do one piece of work where you really work really hard. So, you know, for the last six months of my sort of graduate world, I basically had a poster in my room that said, get up, go to school, graduate. And I didn't do anything else except do just that. Like nothing, nothing else. Because that you have to understand how hard you can actually work in your life once. Because it'll serve you well. Because in everything I've done since then, and I put way more hours into work now than I ever did as a grad student. But I always look back on that and think, well, I remember those days. Like I know I can work really hard. And at the end of the day, like smarts is so overrated, so overrated. Like believe me, like being smart is completely overrated. I, you cannot believe the number of people I hire 
on like a monthly basis who come to me and come to me from the best, best universities you can possibly imagine with the most unbelievable GPAs who don't get a second look. Um, I'm not suggesting that <laughs> disqualifies you from getting a second look, but it isn't the only reason why you will get that job. For me, you know, there are people that we hire that are coming from very different sort of backgrounds and, and sort of, you know, for me that working hard ends up being much more useful than just being really smart. Words to live by. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>